Heavenly Father, thank you very much for this time to gather together with your people. We're very grateful that you've brought us here and given us a desire to know the truth and given us the understanding of the scriptures. We appreciate all the trials that you're bringing, and we ask for more faith that we can appreciate them more, because we struggle, as you know, with all these things. Be with all those that are suffering and having all different sorts of health trials and financial trials and family trials and just increase their faith to endure faithfully what you're sending. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, welcome, everybody. We're back on our Wednesday night study here. And as the Lord always does, he takes us from topic to topic, and it always seems to apply to what's going on in the body. And so the, the topic that's been on my mind a lot recently is what is love and how does it operate inside of relationships? And there's been a particular need recently. Um, I know Mike and I have both been doing uh, a good amount of marriage counseling recently, Mike more so than myself, but definitely it's coming up a lot. And we know that marriage is a symbol of Christ in the church. So those that are not married in the body are is just in just as much of need of the advice as those that are married because we're all married to Christ and married to one another in the spirit. And so we have to learn how to operate properly as a, as a body of Christ in the spirit. So we're going to go through first Corinthians, um, 13, one to seven. We're probably, we're not going to get through all the verses tonight, but we'll do about half of them. And then this will turn into a, to a part two. So let me read 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 7. Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, does, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. He said a lot right there. And basically all of the scriptures, as we go through the different stories, bear out this process. And as we live our lives that God has written, we're going to live through every single one of these things. And we're first going to not do it. We're going to do the opposite of what it says. And others are going to do the opposite to us. And then as you go through that process, you start to learn the incredible value of the love of God operating in us, and he changes us to do it this way. So as we're going through this, the thought that's been on my mind so often is nobody can be anywhere other than where they are today. So where are you? To, where you are today is exactly the day that God wrote in the book for today. It can't be different. It can't be faster. It can't be slower. It is where it is. So the first step in love is, in being in obedience to God is you have to understand that he has worked everything to be in this exact circumstance to learn the things we have to learn. So when we're in that state of complaining against God, railing against him, blaming other people for what they're doing, you can't act in love because you're caught in the flesh and you're just blaming and complaining and whining. But once we step back and say, okay, the Lord has worked this. What is the proper biblical response to this circumstance? How should I be? And when that's in our mind, we can start to keep these commands and things start to go a lot better, which the Lord works all of those things. So the first one is love suffers long. It, uh, it's the same word as patient, but patience is suffering for a long time. It's going through suffering properly. 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack or slow concerning his promise, as some count slackness or slowness, but is long-suffering, he's patient towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 
So we should think like God. And as we deal with others in our lives, whether we're married or single or family or work or whatever it is, we want others to come to repentance. That's our first and foremost goal. We don't want them to suffer just to suffer. We don't want to torment them or get revenge on them. We should want to say, look, I'm going to bear with you so that in due time you can repent. And it's a really important mindset because the carnal mind doesn't think that way. It doesn't want to forgive. It doesn't want to let go. It wants vengeance. And it's it's bad how the carnal mind operates. Acts 19.15, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is, cho- he is a chosen vessel of mine, speaking to Paul, speaking of Paul, to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Well, as we live by every word, this is the prophecy to us. The Lord will show us how many things we must, must suffer for his name. And you suffer within your own self, and you also suffer for others. So don't be surprised when the Lord sends you people to love that are unlovable and that are difficult and they're a pain in your side. Look at what Christ dealt with. I mean, he lived his entire life with an unconverted people. Not one of them understood everything, anything. They didn't know who he was hardly until after the spirit came and they were changed and then they started to see it. So just like Christ, until the spirit comes, we're going to walk among a carnal people and they're not going to treat us right. And if we have the spirit of God and we know better, then we have the higher calling to bear up with them, to be long suffering towards them until Christ be formed in them, which is exactly what Paul did for all those he ministered to. Ephesians 4, 1 to 3, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. Why do you have to bear with one another? Because we're difficult. We're a pain. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. He has to say this because the carnal mind is enmity against God. The flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. And it will fight against God and not like him. It'll persecute his prophets. It'll give you a hard time. So expect that. Don't be surprised when it comes. And it's coming so that we can learn to be lowly, to be gentle, to be long-suffering. Just as a a parent raises their children. So we have to raise one another. The next one is to be kind. Luke 6, 35 and 36. But love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And when he says lend, he doesn't just mean money. He means everything. Lend your time, lend your affections, lend your encouragement. And don't expect anything back because you're not going to get it for a while. Fruit trees take anywhere from two to seven years to bear fruit. So if you're expecting immediate results when you do good to people, you're going to be sorely disappointed. (laughs) Because sometimes it takes a long time. But it's worth it. And your reward will be great when you love your enemies and do good and lend, not expecting anything. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and the evil. Well, we like to be kind to the thankful and the good. But he says, no, no. Even the Gentiles do that. Be kind to those who don't thank you. Be kind to those who mistreat you and don't appreciate you and don't understand how much you care for them. Those are the ones you really need to be kind to. Therefore, be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Don't expect people to change right away. Give them space to repent. Give them a little bit of truth and leave them alone. Recognize how hard it is to overcome the things they're dealing with. And I found that one of the roots of not being merciful is not understanding that that person can't be anywhere other than where they are. That God has made it where they're trapped there. And when you think about that, you go, wow, I could be in the exact same position. Let me help them out of that. Sometimes it's being patient and kind. Sometimes it is a sharp rebuke. But don't go there quickly. You know, be slow to judge. Wait as long as you can to have to be you know, hard on people. Romans 2, 1 to 6, 
Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. He's just saying, take the plane from your own eye before you go reaching for your brother. Like, just contemplate yourself first. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things, are doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness? It's the same word as kindness. Forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. I mean, I mean, think about that for a minute. The Lord knows every thought we have, every day, all the time. We know we think a lot of bad stuff, right? Before you can take your thoughts captive. He doesn't kill us, right? He, he gives you some discipline. He makes it hard, but he could make it a lot worse. He's being very merciful and being very patient, implying just enough pressure to keep us moving, but not too far. And we should be the same way with each other. We should have high standards. We should be striving for the kingdom. We should provoke one another to love and good works. But be sensitive in how you do it. Don't push too hard. You know, just be kind. But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. So when we're in that stage of judging others, being hypocritical, being harsh, saying, how could you ever do, I would never do that. We're just storing up wrath for ourselves. And the Lord's going to say, I'll show you how, right? And then we get put in our place and we say, Lord, I'm sorry, I'll be more merciful. And that's in our book. We have to go through that and expect for others to have to go through that before their heart will be softened. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Why does he have to say it? Because that's what we're going to be full of. <laughs> we, we don't like the plan. We're frustrated at others. We want them to be different, and we want it to change right now. And so we're full of all this bitterness and wrath and clamor, and the Lord says, just, shh, just be quiet. Calm down. Be kind to one another. Tenderhearted. Forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So if we're not tender-hearted and forgiving towards others, it's because we're, we don't understand how much we've been forgiven and how messed up we all are in our own right. So the more we stop and think about that, then we're much more patient with others because we, we know we need patience from God and others on ourselves and mercy. Luke 7, 47, Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Well, we all have a lot that needs to be forgiven. Some of us just don't realize it yet, right? Love does not envy. It, a, a big part of not envying, it's understanding sovereignty. It's understanding that every person gets exactly what they need for their life to get in the kingdom. So if you're going to envy others and start comparing yourself, you're basically saying, God, you kind of messed the plan up. And you gave them too much and me not enough. So you're really mad at God. And we all do it. Like everyone does it. But we have to come to accept that our book can't be any different than it is. It's what we need. And that it's the, the exact part God wants us to play. And the more we fight it, it's hard to kick against the pricks. It just, it just gets worse and more difficult until we surrender to it. And then things get better. And you can have contentment. And you can have joy. And you can rejoice with others in whatever they've been given. Acts 7, 9. And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt. So what was it that caused Joseph's brothers to be so horrible to him and throw him in the pit so he was sold into Egypt? They envied him. He had the coat of many colors. You know, They didn't say, we're happy for you, brother, that you've been blessed of our father. No, they envied him. And we will envy others in our own time, and others will envy us. James 4, 1 to 3. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you don't ask. 
and you ask and don't receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. This is telling us exactly what we're going to do. We're going to fight at our minds. We're going to fight with others. We're going to complain and whine. And then we're not going to ask. And when we do, we're going to ask wrongly. And through that process, we learn to ask properly, to be patient, to be content with our lot in life. Because it's not natural to be content with what you're given. It's natural to always want more or want it to be different. It's a miracle to be truly content in where you've been placed. Matthew 27, 17, and 18. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Who do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. So the more we become like Christ, the carnal people around us will envy us. And they're going to give us a hard time, right? And it's also going to happen on our own minds. Our old man hates the new man. There's going to be a war in our heavens. But the more we can overcome that, as God gives us that ability, we can go to the cross. And we can understand that's the will of the Father. It's not pleasant. It still hurts. Dying daily is painful. But at least we know we're doing the will of God and it has a good result in the end. And that's what gets us through the tough process. Love does not parade itself. Other translations say it's not vain or boastful. It doesn't brag. So this one ties back into envy. When we're boastful and vain and bragging, we provoke others to envy. And we don't want to do that. And we have to really be careful what we say and when and what we share and who we share it with because you don't want to provoke other people to envy you. Sometimes you just can't. Just being a light in your own way will provoke envy in the old man, but don't make it worse, right? Try to be subtle and humble and just quiet and let others praise you. Proverbs 27, 1 and 2. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. Let another man praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. That's hard because we all naturally like talk about ourselves and it's taking those thoughts captive and to say nope not going to do it if the lord wants the glory then he will cause others to acknowledge that and the only time paul talked about himself was when he had to defend his ministry he had to say look here's the fruit i've borne so you guys can see but he was he was forced into it because of the accusations and so that's what we do romans 12 3 for i say that so i say through the grace given to me to everyone who's among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Again, why does he say don't think highly of yourself, more highly than you ought? Because we're going to think more highly than we ought. Where if we can wait for others to praise us and for the fruit to come, then it'll be known that the glory of God is working there. And we won't think too highly of ourselves. Daniel 4, 30 and 31. The king spoke saying, Is not this king great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? Look what I did. While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. We're all going to do the exact same thing. We glory in what we call our strength. It's the Lord's, not ours. And then he will take it from us. And it will be what happens here in Daniel 4, 32 and 33. And they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. So when you're crushed and humbled and your plans fall apart, it makes you acutely aware that all the reasons you had success before, the Lord just made it work. He gave you health. He gave you opportunity. He gave you favor with people. He sent you. He just, he does it. And when it's all going so well, you just forget how much so. And then when he makes it all fall apart, you're like, wow, yeah, he gives it to whomever he wants. 
That very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. We realize we're a beast. That's what that's saying. You realize we're just a carnal pile of dust that the Lord has made what he wants it to be. It's a very painful process to realize that, but it's also very good because now, like Job at the end, we can have double restored to us in the spirit and a degree of prosperity in the flesh as much as is expedient. And we won't be puffed up because we know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he pleases, which leads us to love is not puffed up. 1 Corinthians 4, 6, and 7. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. If it's based upon our thoughts, our opinions, our ability, then it's, well, I'm better than you, and I think this is the right way. But when it's based upon the scriptures, we're all just submissive to that. And you're just pointing to the higher authority. And then no one's above anyone. You're just saying, hey, that's what the word says. For who makes you differ from another? And why do you have and what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? I mean, if any of us has knowledge or something to say, where does it come from? God, through the Spirit and in the Scriptures. So what do you have to boast of? If he chose to put it in your hand, so what? It's his, not yours. So who are we to think we're anything? But that's not natural to think that until he makes you, puts your face in the dust for a while and you grow your, you know, your eagle's claws and realize you're a beast and then you know. Colossians 2, 18 and 19. Let no one cheat you of your reward. So this is how you lose your reward. Your reward is being puffed up on our fleshly mind taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. There is a process to discern truth. It's the sum of the word, it's rightly dividing, and it's done through the body of Christ with a proper biblical process of multitude of counselors. If we try to do it by ourselves in isolation and get all puffed up, then it doesn't work. You have to hold fast to the head and the process the head is given. As some have said in the body many times, we're not Christ individually, we're Christ collectively as a body. And you can't go be Christ all by yourself. You have to have connection and function with the brethren. And the reason that's so hard is because it requires a lot of love. You've got to bear with and you've got to forgive and you've got to love and you've got to be merciful and kind because we're a mess in some ways, right? Where the, uh, the trough is clean, there's no increase of the oxen. But if the trough is dirty, the oxen are eating, they're working. And so if there's going to be work going in our midst and growing together, there's going to be some iron sharpening iron or some, some difficulties and some disagreements and some sparks flying. So we have to be willing to pay that price to get the prize. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 and 2, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife, and you are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. So love is not just, hey, let's all love each other and get along. It requires discipline sometimes. And if any one of us is walking in disobedience and immorality, whether it be physically speaking or with false doctrine, we can't be puffed up and say, well, we just all love each other and we just all get along and that's okay. No, you have to follow the proper, patient, kind, biblical process that eventually leads to some strong words and some judgments. I mean, that comes in time. You don't hasten to that, but you have to do it when it's necessary. It's just as wrong to be angry and impatient when you shouldn't be as it is to not be angry when you should be. Like those are 
Just like a parent. Like if a parent is never angry and never disciplines their kids, how good of a parent are they, right? But same thing, if they're always losing their head and screaming at their kid for every little thing, they're not a good parent either. It's that perfect balance. And the last one we're going to stop on tonight is love does not behave rudely. Other translations say it does not behave indecently. And it's used here in 1 Corinthians 7.36. But if any man thinks he is behaving improperly towards his virgin, if she has passed the flower of youth, and thus it must be, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin, let them marry. So the context here is a, a man who's with a woman, and he's starting to act improperly. He's starting to express his things that should only be expressed in a marriage relationship, right? He's doing with his sister in Christ. And Paul's saying, when that starts to happen, it's time for you to get married. But the command is, love does not behave indecently. It's saying, when we're walking in perfect obedience, you will not behave improperly towards anyone in the body of Christ or anyone in the world in any way. 1 Corinthians 12, 23, And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, of these we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. That's the same word. It basically means your private parts. Like those are covered with clothing. So this command is really saying, don't do what's inappropriate. Don't expose things that shouldn't be exposed. Don't talk about things that shouldn't be talked about. Sometimes you have to go deal with the delicate parts. Do it in private, right? Do it in the proper way, just as in a marriage relationship or with a doctor. You don't go exposing those things to everybody. You know, even the carnal world has laws against doing that. And it's telling us in the spirit, you know, act with decency. Act with care for one another as we're dealing with these difficult things in us that are going to be exposed. Cover one another's sin, right? That's the goal, not to expose it and embarrass people. And that would be very rude to, to do that. So love does not behave rudely. So that's where we're going to end for tonight. And um, hopefully uh, we'll be able to finish the next ones in part two. So if anybody wants to ask any questions or make any comments... Hands here. Here's Mike. Mike, go ahead. You gotta unmute yourself, Mike. Well, thank you. <laughs> Talking away. <laughs> What I said was, thank you very much. This is very good and very timely. Uh, you know, I, I suppose it would be timely anytime, but, uh, hmm. you know, we're, we're all struggling to remember what we know. We already know that God is sovereign and that he's working everything we do after the counsel of his own will. But it is, it's hard to remember that every day, day in and day out. Yeah. And uh, the script, the scripture that I wanted to uh, uh, tie in with what you said here is, uh, I guess it's. Uh, hold on, just a minute. I'll I'll get it. It's. Uh, First Corinthians, I think. Let me see. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 4, 7. Uh, who makes you to differ from another? And what do you have that you've not received? Uh, the fact is that everything that we do and say has been written down in advance. So that whether it's good or bad, in us or in the other person, that's what, like you said earlier, that what happens today is what had to happen today, good or bad. And so it's all been given to us to live out what's written in our book. We have no choice in the matter. 
we we make choices but they're caused choices now if you did receive it why do you glory and you could say also why do you get angry at your brother because he did something to offend you as if you had not received it so i just wanted to add that verse to what you had said it just gives it uh, more backing thank you thank you very much yeah amen mike and um that's a that's a very narrow way to know that the lord is working it and then to be righteously angry like you should be angry at your kids when they do bad things but don't lose your head understand that the lord made them do it that's in their book i'm going to use anger as a tool for teaching and for growing it's not just out of control i'm bitter at you and i'm mad that you did this and how could you ever like that that's not the right narrow way but that's a miracle to have that power to be able to wield it in righteousness did you read uh, be ye angry um i haven't read that one yet but i've been saying it but let's look at yeah you have it's in james i don't know exactly where hold on just a minute yeah james 4 26 be ye angry and sin not let not the sun go down upon your wrath so it's it's uh it's right to be angry. You should not be, you know, unaffected by evil and injustice and, and, right. and crime, crime and, and, and war and things like that. You should be affected, but you don't, you don't have to be anxious about it because you know who's running the show. Right. That's exactly right. And when it says, don't let the sun go on your anger, you know, it doesn't mean you always have to settle everything before literally the end of the day. That's not reasonable. Like sometimes you should wait till tomorrow and calm down. But that saying is the sun, which is the truth. Don't let the truth be gone from your anger. Have truth in your anger and do it in righteousness. That's the, that's the command. Do anger properly. Don't be in a hurry. And the worst thing you can do when you're out of control angry is to be hasty. Take the time to settle down and gather your thoughts and, Look inwardly before you go and <laughs> unleash it on somebody else, right? Because a lot of times our anger, it's really anger at God for what he's doing. We just don't realize it and we're really railing against him and, and the other person as if they could have control over that. But when you have it properly, you do it in an instructing manner, not a out of control ranting complaint. Right. And anytime we're frustrated, our frustration is not with the person that we think we're frustrated with. It's actually with God. We're frustrated with God. Yeah. Like a great example is Christ when he says, oh, how long do I have to bear with you, you faithless generation? Like he, he was teaching them. He's using that to teach them you're faithless, to show you where you are. He knew God was sovereign. He knew he was doing that. Still in your flesh, it's very unpleasant. And God causes us to say those things for the benefit of others. Because you need that motivation to change. You can't be like, oh, it's okay. God's sovereign. You're fine right where you are. No, you need to grow. And I'm mad about it. <laughs> That's a, a good thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, imagine if God never got angry. Nothing would ever change, right? Just keep on going right like it is. Anybody else? Boyd. Hello, Boyd. Go ahead. Hi, Mitch. I've been thinking about these verses for the past couple of months. Uh, I'm glad you quoted them. It's in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the so-called love chapter. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's, a, there's some astonishing things said here. Verse 2, it says, And though I have give the prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and though i have all faith so that i could remove mountains and have not love i am nothing mm -hmm. my goodness you could study all your life and understand scriptures and if you don't have love you're nothing and of course everything we have is is has been given to us so if if, if i don't have love it's because he hasn't given it to me yet and the next verse says, and though I bestow all my goods, not some of them, not many, but all my goods to feed the poor, 
and then I give my body to be burned. Oh my goodness. You mean people have done this? Because, you know, he didn't say this unless people do it. Apparently, people had been burned at the stake. I've read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Many people were burned at the stake. Mm -hmm. And have not loved, it profits me nothing. That means there have been people that have been burned alive, mm -hmm. and it profit them, profited them nothing because they didn't have love. They, it wouldn't be, the Bible wouldn't be saying this if it wasn't true. Yep. And that's just astonishing to me that somebody would be able to, because um, I know Servetus in, in France, uh, I think it was John Calvin, he stood there and watched and said, yeah, he should be burned at the stake because he didn't believe in the Trinity. Mm -hmm. now, whether or not he had love or not, I have no idea. <laughs> but I can imagine that maybe he didn't have love and that it was no, no, no profit to him. It's just astonishing to me that that could happen, that, that the Lord could cause somebody to allow themselves to be burned yet not have love, but apparently it has happened. Well, I, I just can't, I can't get around that. It's just, I'm astonished. At that. Well, well, here's what it is, Boyd. It's a great point you bring up is Paul says in Philippians, to live is Christ, to die is gain. It is easier to go be burned at the stake and give all your stuff away and study all day long than it is to actually walk with someone step by step through their trials in life over an extended period of time. That is hard. Going and dying is just, however, you're in pain for an hour or two and it's over. But do it for five years with a bunch of people, right? Yeah, that's a good point. Excellent. Very good, Mitch. Um, so it's, it's the only way, you know. You yeah, some people suffer all their lives, you know, like my mother, she suffered pain for decades. And I think about it, even people in the Holocaust, they suffer a lot. But, you know, there's some people in the Holocaust, they, they died pretty quickly. I mean, they, they were gas in the gas chamber, and then the bodies were burned after they were already dead. And, yeah, they suffered, but it was very short-lived suffering, whereas she suffered for decades with just terrible pain. Yeah. Uh, and we all die. You know, we all do die. And you're right. Once, once you're dead, you're out of pain, and you're just asleep. And, mm hmm uh, you have no more uh, suffering. It's those who are still remain alive that are still suffering. Yep. I mean, just look, just look at Paul's ministry. I mean, how much he traveled and lived with these people and taught the Corinthians and bearing with them through all their mistakes and trials. Then they turn on him and they're working with false prophets and he's having to defend his ministry. And I mean, and then they abandon him and Alexander the coppersmith, all the uh, just. Uh, the, just you talk about turmoil in his heart and in his mind and in physically speaking, and um, that's a miracle. And, th and those were when, when when the Lord said, "I will show many how many things I will show you how many things you must suffer for my namesake." Paul fulfilled that First Corinthians one twenty four. I fill up what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. What was lacking in the afflictions of Christ is raising the church to maturity, and you've got to have people that do that for one another and it's hard work but it's very rewarding work it's really good to see it i guess it's being a living sacrifice it's being a living sacrifice that's what it is but uh, mitch i'm astonished at you too i mean you had the answer uh, thank you very much for that well it's uh, the lord's knowledge right <laughs> he gives it to him ever he wills well, I appreciate you. Well, I appreciate you too, Boyd. The Lord's given us all our functions, right? And we just do what he's... Every one of us is doing what was in the book for today. We couldn't do any different if we wanted to. Anybody else? Miss Wendy and Angela. Wendy, go ahead. Thank you, Mitch. That's all I wanted to do is just thank you so much for the study. Um, I can see how the Father is just really um, um, making, tempering us. And um, and this is a part we really, I, I really have to be tempered in. And I appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Angela, you there? You gotta unmute yourself.
I'm assuming that the Sandra Vincent here is Angela, not Sandy. So if that is Sandy. <laughs> yeah, it's Angela. Okay. <clears throat> There you go. I'm sorry, I couldn't I couldn't find the microphone for a minute. I just have a question. I was just thinking as you were talking about suffering and stuff. I understand the suffering of those in the body and stuff, but why is it? Uh, what's the purpose for, say, um, a person that never really comes to know the Lord? What's the purpose for their suffering? I mean, the scriptures talk about there's vessels for honor and vessels for dishonor. And and right. some people just, their book in this life is just to live in vanity and not be shown the truth. I mean, they're going to, that experience will be used for them in the lake of fire. They're going to look back upon it. So it won't be lost. It's just not in their book in this life to have that um, that answer given. So when we look at the end, the Lord will say, I, I wrote their book in this exact way to get them saved at this point in time. And it'll make sense to us when we see the whole thing. Okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate your your study and your faithfulness and all. You're welcome. Glad you made that, it. that essentially is what happened to virtually all the people in Canaan that Israel dispossessed. They never knew God. They, they, they just, their sins had to be fulfilled. It says, the sins of the Amorites are not yet, the iniquities of the Amorites are not yet ful fulfilled, been fulfilled. So God has actually just created people to be sinners for the purpose of demonstrating that sin is, is uh, not a good, you know, it produces death. The wages of sin is death. And most people are, that's just what their life is all about in this age. All the people down through history, these things happen to them and they are written for our admonition. That, that's, that's why it all happened to them. Israel never knew Christ. And they all lived and died just for our admonition. And we will be given the chance of returning that love and all that has been bestowed upon us by by giving our lives for those various people and being their redeemers in the lake of fire. Yeah, amen, Mike. You, you, Here's a, you stop and think about the whole thing every now and, the, and then, you know, I stop and think about everything and it's like, it's, it's just so amazing that it feels like, like your mind is just going to explode. There's just so much. Yeah, and, and it's just so wonderful, and I mean, it really is, Angela. I, it really is. I can't even I can't put it into words sometimes. You know, the other verse to witness to that here is Isaiah forty three four. It says, "Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored, and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you, and people for your life." So like, Mike was, so like Mike was saying, through their unbelief, we believe. You have to have vessels of dishonor so that there can be vessels of honor. They'll get saved right. in their own right, but for now, they're being given for us to learn. That's that's it right there. Yeah, and that's... Um, Isaiah 43, 4. And that should make us be very grateful and appreciative of what the Lord's giving us and to take it as a very serious stewardship because he's, it's a great price that's being paid for us to have these things. And that, well, that in itself just blows your mind. I mean, it's like, who am I Lord? <laughs> we're, we're not, who are we? No, who, yeah. Jars, just jars of clay that he chose to put his spirit in, you know, it could have been anybody. Yeah. He just made us weak and said, I pick you. So we can't boast in it. We just have to acknowledge that this is how the Lord has chosen to work, and we just have to be faithful in that. I, I think it's just a humbling experience. It's like, wow. Yeah. I mean, it just... Yeah, it really... May I ask you a scripture? Sure. Go ahead, Wendy. It, it's Psalm 139.6, and I always love this one, Angela. It says, such knowledge is too wonderful 
to me. Mm. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Praise and God. it is this knowledge that the Lord's given us. It is. It's too wonderful. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Mm. May, may I share a little bit? I shared it with Brother Mike, but I was just thinking, my mind has just been going and going, a lot of things going through my head. But um, when I seen my, uh, well, she's a nurse practitioner. When she read the results from my uh, MRI and she said, well, she said it could very well just be scar tissue from the, what you might call it, the strokes that I've had in the past. But she said, I don't know that that's what it is. She said, because it's, it's not looking the same. And she said, I'm very afraid for you. And it kind of, I don't know, it was kind of strange for her to, to say that. I don't know, I saw it as strange, but I said, why are you afraid for me? And she said, well, you know, it, it could be brain cancer. And the Lord just gave me the words and my mouth just started to open up and surprised me even. Hmm. And like I told Brother Mike, I preached a little sermon in like 45 minutes <laughs> and it was like all about death. What death is, it's like, it has no sting. It's not, mm. uh, I don't know. I was even kind of amazed myself because I think, okay, Lord, what if it is that, you know? And it's like, all I could say is praise God either way. Praise God. It's, um, the book that the Lord has wrote for me has been a very difficult book. And, and, and even that I praise the Lord for, and I'm grateful for it. You know, I saw it at one time as, you know, why are you doing this? It was like, like Job, the thing that I feared the most has come upon me, you know, when I started coming, going through depression and stuff. But now knowing what I know, it's like, okay, okay. It's like, um, so much peace that I don't, you know, when the Bible talks about peace that passes all understanding, it's like I finally know what that is, what that means, the peace of God, to know that you could go to sleep mm -hmm. and be at peace and not know nothing, just sleep until the resurrection. And it's like, wow. And I guess the fact that knowing that he is the one that's in control, if that's what takes place, you know, regardless who it is or how it happens or whatever, it's like, wow, he's in charge of everything. There's not one single thing that he is not in control of. Yeah, and, you know, Angela, to your point, the Lord is gets a lot of glory. And that's why he gave you those words here in this impossible circumstance against all these things that should make people terrified here he's got this song of praise coming from your mouth i mean he he wrote that day in his book in his play of this life to be a city on a hill in that moment in you well praise god i'm just the fact you didn't lose your mind and uh, become hysterical and break down well it's... you know when i first went started going through depression and stuff you know it's like yeah i used to think about what could happen what would be the worst thing that would happen you know going through all that and stuff and i kept it to myself for a long time because i thought i'm gonna be locked up someday you know they're just gonna lock me up because everybody's gonna think i'm losing it and that was the worst thing that i could think of and now it's like you know they may have said okay you know the doctor said well it could be this and you know it may very well be you know but just it just i don't know just blows me away it's like lord you're so awesome you're just so awesome and and when she said the words and stuff it's like I, that the fact that i wasn't even faced by it and i started to tell her about death and what death really is and i said we've been uh deceived i say even that deception was god you know, worked it out, whatever, but. Yeah. And, and I mean, she sat there with her mouth wide open, like, wow. 
Yeah. Wow. She said, I've never heard anything like that before. Yeah. I bet she's never seen anybody react like that before either. <laughs> yeah. That's probably, probably not. And that's why the Lord does these things. Like he, and that comforts me a lot when I think about his entire plan. Every day is written for him to be glorified. Like that's the entire purpose. And if he's chosen his elect, he is going to cause that light to shine, regardless of what we are. Despite that, he's going to do it. And it's yeah. very encouraging when you have stories like Angela, when you find yourself in that impossible Red Sea moment, and he just manifests his glory. And you go, wow. You're almost like observing it, like a third, like, like out-of-body experience. Like Angela's like kind of watching yourself, and you're almost surprised. Exactly, because I remember talking to Sue and her, you know, when she first found out and stuff and, and, and thinking about, wow, you know, how would you react, whatever, you know, what would be your, your reaction be? And it's like, wow. And it's just a knowing deep inside of you that, you know, it's okay. It's just okay. I mean, he's working it out. You know, and, and like I said, it's like my, the book, that he wrote for me has been a very, very hard one. And um, there was a time when the depression first came on that I was very mad at him, very mad at the Lord. And like I said, like Job, whatever, but coming to realize, okay, this is the book that he wrote. And I look back on it now and I think, Lord, I wouldn't have it any other way. Had I not experienced everything that I've experienced, have I, had I not gone through the, the, negativity and and the evil and everything else i wouldn't even be where i'm at now and he he brought me here because of the way that he wrote my book amen amen sister he's it's all gonna be worth it in the end i still have a lot of questions i mean i have a lot of questions whatever but like i said i feel i feel at peace and well, we're very happy to hear the prayers answered. In the middle of the storm, he's giving you peace. It's a great testimony, Angela. Thank you. For I, I never knew. I never, I mean, I've known peace, but I never knew. I mean, it, it's God's peace. I mean. Yeah. So when do you hear back, did you say? I They scheduled my appointment. They had said May 30th. And they moved it up to May 24th. So I'll see the neurologist then, and he'll run whatever test he's going to do, whatever. And, um, okay. okay. We'll find out then. Something happens to me. I'm just. Hey, Mitch, can I share a scripture? Hold, just, hold on one second. Martha's saying something. Say it a little louder, Martha. Oh, every time something happens to me, I just. I wonder why. And then I stop and remind myself, you know, you got this going on and you're, you're the one who caused all this. I don't know why, but I'm sure you got a reason. Mm -hmm. And uh, pass it off. Deal right. with it best you can. That's right. When they came in and said, you lose your leg. Oh my goodness! You remember that night? I'm standing right there. That was a day. Was, I know he's in control and stuff, and I have to remind myself of that every day. We we all do. We all have to remind ourselves every day. But he does bring that to our remembrance every time something happens, whatever that you think, okay, this is gonna be a little bit too hard. It's like, okay, I'm doing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Amen. Go ahead, Wendy. Well, after that, I, I would have to say he he truly knows how much we can bear. And, mm -hmm. and, and he does provide that way out. And that way is Christ. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking about the scripture because you were you kept mentioning that, you know, he's given it for this day, this day. Um, this is the way this book is written for this day. And it, mm -hmm. our, one of my favorite scriptures is Psalm 25, 12. And it says, he that feareth the Lord, he teaches in the way that he chooses. So each and every book has been so meticulously orchestrated out to bring about the peaceable fruits of Christ Jesus. 
And that's good news. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And, you know, and a part of that is like, take the story of Job. There's a time to just sit with someone in the suffering. Like, you, you can't sing songs to somebody with a heavy heart. It's like taking away a coat in the cold winter. It, you just need to sit with them and suffer with them and then wait for the right time to start bringing in the encouragement and the, you know. That, that's a hard thing to learn because when we have all faith and all knowledge and all understanding and, hey, it's all working for good and God's going to save everyone in the end, you tend to want to just bust out and say that. But that's not what love is. Love doesn't insist on its own way. It doesn't try to drag people there. It waits. It's patient. It's kind. It comforts. It slow to do those things. And we all learn one bit at a time. Well, you, but the way you well, for the body that the Lord reminds us of that on a daily basis. Yeah, amen. That's a tough one. Yeah, the hardest thing at first is comforting and counseling people through things you haven't been through, you know? But the more you stop regarding things after the flesh, it doesn't matter what the circumstance is. If it's bringing them to their wit's end, it's their wit's end. It doesn't matter if that wouldn't take you to your wit's end. It is for them. So how can we expect someone to respond differently than they are? And then you can start to comfort and counsel in anything that happens. Like, oh, this is yours. Okay, this is hard for you. Got it. You can deal with it. You know, uh, when Willard died, I don't know how many years ago I've been, you, you know? No, it's been eight years. And yeah, Sandy thinks it's about eight years ago. Anyway, uh, like you said, you know, you, you want to comfort someone, but sometimes you just have to just suffer with them. You can't, it's, it's just not yet time to comfort them. You mourn with them. You mourn with them first. And I, I remember... Reminding Betty of uh, uh, Ecclesiastes 7 1, right after Willard died. You know, I said, You know, Betty, it's the day of one's death is better than the day of his birth. And she says, I know that, Mike, but right now, she says, that just doesn't ring true to me. You know, she says, I, I just can't, I can't yeah. think like that right at the moment. And, and I realized, you know, that I needed to just mourn with her the loss of our dearest brother. And uh, and it just it just wasn't the time yeah. yet to be trying to put that in perspective. You just you just feel their pain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, Betty, you there? Yeah, I was just gonna say it'd be eleven years. This oh, my, my, my. Yeah. That long. Time flies, huh? It sure does. <laughs> yeah. I was going to yeah. say it had to be more than eight because I've been in for eight years and he was gone before I came in. Yeah. yeah. You, you remember all that, don't you, Betty? Oh, yeah. I do. Yeah. I remember everything. Y'all did mourn with me, though, Mike. You and Sandy. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Of course, yes. Well, you know what I said, though, when he left, I said, God's got work with me now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I, can't, I can't say that it was not of him, but you, like you said, you do have to mourn. You have yeah, to have yeah. time to uh, ask, ask questions, too, like, okay, I know it was meant to be. But I've still got to get through this. You got to help me each day. Mm -hmm. Even even oh mourn the loss of uh, Saul. You know, we, we should mourn with those that mourn, whoever they are. Yeah, Ted, Ted and I have talked about this, you know, and and like I said, I mean, we don't know either way yet. But you know, if it turns out. Yes, there is cancer, whatever. We've discussed it all and everything. And the Lord has given him peace also. And um, 
um, he said, on one hand, he said, it would be easier, he said, to let you go than to see you suffer, continue to see you suffering. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He said the suffering has gone on for so long. And his question for many years was, the Lord can do it. Why hasn't he done it? He said all he has to do is speak a word, you know, concerning the depression and all the other stuff. It's like, why didn't he just speak a word? And little by little, he started to learn more. Just like I did. I mean, I, I asked the same questions in the beginning and stuff, but. Good for you, Ted. Good for yeah. you. Yeah. Praise the Lord for that. Well, I'm going to unmute everybody else. Thank you. thank you for your study and thank everybody, all my brothers and sisters. Yeah. It's great thank to you. Be here, Angela. <clears throat> Love you, I see your Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. It was a wonderful study, and I appreciate all the comments afterwards. And my heart goes out to you, Angela. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate every one of you. There's not one in the body that does not have a special place in their heart. Mm. And I, that's the way it is with all of us. I mean, mm. praise God for the body of Christ. Praise God for bringing us to the body of Christ and making us, for making us that body. It's like, like I said, who am I, Lord? Who am I? You know, Amen. He knows exactly what he's doing. Amen. Good night. 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 Thank you. Good night, Brian. Yeah, thanks so much, Mitch. Good night. Thank you, Mitch. Good night, Karen. Good night, Mike. Everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night, Karen. Well,